Thank you, Warren. I really appreciate the uh, the invitation. Uh, most of you folks know that I'm a dairy cattle guy, but my PhD advisor was, in fact, a, is a beef cattle breeder, Don Frankie, and uh, I won't say he managed to teach me a lot about beef cattle. What what I really remember over and over again is Denny Cruz saying, "J. Cole, you know that's just not how things work over here." So, so Warren didn't give me a lot of correction. He kind of hung me out here because uh, he said, well, I said, what should I talk about? He said, well, whatever you want to talk about. I said, all right. So I, I used this great question, right? What does the dairy industry know about inbreeding that you don't? And then I got here and I listened to people talking and I realized I really set myself up for failure because the thing about cattlemen is they'll answer your question, whether it's rhetorical or not. So I'm a little worried that we're going to get to the end and someone's going to go, we already knew all of that. So a little bit of a risk here. Okay, so I've kind of broken this up into a few points and I'm going to walk through here. I have half an hour, right? 40 minutes. Oh, 40 minutes. Well, sure, we got lots of time, man. All right. So inbreeding is different things to different people. And I really appreciate Dr. Hayes' presentation earlier because he helped kind of uh, set up and explain a few things, probably better than I could if so I don't have to explain everything. I'm going to talk a little bit about why new inbreeding matters more than old inbreeding, right? Also, I'll point out that we're not alone. Sometimes it feels like here in the, in the cattle community, we're the only folks who worry about inbreeding, but that's not necessarily true. Inbreeding affects different traits in different ways. I'll show some examples of that. And then probably the, the longest part of the talk, it's my favorite part anyway, is that nobody can agree what we should do about inbreeding. So I'm going to share some ideas on what we perhaps could do to manage the problem. And then I have a, a remark or two to wrap up. So to sort of set the stage, we're all running the same race. I understand the race looks a little bit different, you know, in the beef cattle world, because a lot of you may be working with bulls rather than with day line. But that doesn't really change anything, right? I mean, here I talk about AI in the sense of AI companies, but you could think of this as genetic companies, right? They either want to sell you semen with high genetic merit, or they want to sell you bulls of high genetic merit. The higher the genetic merit, the more marketable they are. One of the inevitable consequences of that is when you're really pushing to have those higher index animals, is you're also going to have more inbreeding because you're kind of going to the bottom there. If you want to have lower rates of inbreeding, generally speaking, you're going to have slower rates of genetic gain. And this is maybe more of a dairy problem than a beef cattle problem, but who is willing to go slower in their genetics program to do a, to more easily manage inbreeding? And I might say it later in the talk, so maybe I'll repeat myself. I was at the Holstein convention a few years ago, and I looked out at all these folks and I said, the problem y'all is that you all think that your neighbor should use different genetics. And there was a lot of looking around the room and nobody rebutted my point. Okay, so inbreeding is different things to different people. And I'm not going to actually show you a bunch of equations and talk about pedigree inbreeding versus genomic inbreeding versus runs of homozygosity because for the points I want to make, the technical differences between these things don't matter. We just need to remember we're talking about the proportion of the genome that two animals share in common. And they share DNA in common because they have shared ancestry somewhere back in time. So this basically inbreeding happens when you mate related animals, which we cannot avoid doing in a finite population. And when we make these related animals, we get increased co-ancestry. That basically means they're related to each other, more and more closely related over time. We can manage inbreeding 
but there's no magic wand to avoid it completely. And I'll share a little story since I have 40 minutes. Is uh, probably in 2001, I was teaching a class to undergraduates, you know, introduction to genetics. And I gave a lecture on inbreeding. And I made some thoughtless remark about Arkansas. And I get to the end of the class, and this student comes flying down to the podium. And they said, I'm from Arkansas. And I really don't appreciate your remarks. And they proceeded to read me the riot act. And one of the only smart things I did in that moment is I did not say, well, I didn't know anybody from Arkansas could read well enough to get into LSU. <laughs> I have to pick up my Arkansas. My wife's family is from Arkansas. They're lovely folks. I worked for, for a senator from Arkansas, but I had to give them a little bit of a hard time. Now, as a geneticist, right, we kind of do make our own problems with inbreeding, right? Well, at least again, dairy in particular, but some of these things are, are also seen in the beef, swine, poultry worlds. We do multiple generations of intense selection, right? So in dairy, for a long time, that was breeding for more milk. It's a little bit more complicated today. Um, our principal selection index in U.S. dairy cattle, the Lifetime Net Merit Index, has about 50 traits in it. And based on Dr. Bullock's comments uh, this morning, I did not have time to revise my slides to talk about selection index. So maybe I need to come back next year because I heard independent culling levels. And I said to myself, but Hazel and Lush showed us in 1937 that independent culling levels are much less efficient than index selection. So maybe we'll put that to the side for today, but uh, we have some work to do. High variance of reproductive success. This is a fancy way of saying that some animals have more offspring than other animals. In particular, this is talking about, again, in the dairy case, bulls. We make you know, hundreds of offspring, thousands of offspring. Elevation, I think, had over about over a million daughters, huge number of daughters. I can tell you when I worked for uh, for Peak Genetics, um, Zazzle, the, the bull Zazzle, we made hundreds of Zazzle sons trying to catch another son that was that was as big far down by as he was. So with that ramps up the problem with inbreeding. We also use best linear unbiased prediction, right? That's a fancy way of talking about the animal model genetic evaluations we use today. The, the animal model evaluations push you heavily into family-based selection. So it gives, it favors families over outcross individuals. So that further compounds this problem. And then, you know, obviously, we, as I just mentioned, um, the artificial insemination companies or the genetics companies will make dozens or sometimes hundreds of sons of high ranking bulls, those sons become the, the, the parents of the next generation. We just keep ramping up that selection pressure. And this is a problem, of course, because inbreeding does have undesirable effects. Um, and Dr. Hay, he talked about it earlier, right? So the, the biggest problem is when we uncover loci that have harmful effects, you know, or have a depressing effect on a particular trait. And um, we have a whole slew of these in dairy that we've discovered just since genomics started in 2009, Holstein haplotype one, those kinds of things. There are lots of other examples, right? Spina, dumps, mule foot that we discovered before genomics. And th this kind of doubling up of these recessive loci it's thought to be the cause of most inbreeding depression. Now, if you're going slowly, that can help because when you increase the levels of inbreeding slowly, you can purge those alleles. You can remove those harmful alleles from the population. But when you're going really, really fast, you don't always leave enough time to push the harmful alleles out and keep the good ones. Because the value of inbreeding is it lets us gather all of the best loci together in the population. And I'll come back to that point in a little bit. 
And the challenge, of course, is because if you think of a chromosome, right, that's a big long piece of DNA. There's 30 chromosomes in cattle. So there's a physical connection. There can be a physical connection between a favorable allele and an unfavorable allele. They can be close together on the same chromosome. So a bad allele can get dragged along with a good allele. We call that hitchhiking. And the other challenge is that over time, when we do a lot of inbreeding, we can see a loss of genetic variance. And this is actually a goat from a goat paper. So why am I showing you goat data? I'm showing you goat data just because the figure is very clear, I thought. So the red bar, so this is time on the x-axis. The red bar is the genetic variation in the population. So all the way over on the left, you see lots of genetic variation. The green bar is how much variation you lose because of, of a process called thrift. And we'll set that to the side for now. And the blue bar is the amount we lose because of increased relationships or increased co-ancestry. So how much variation do we lose because we're losing alleles through the process of inbreeding? And so you see it's about 3%, 4%. Um, in the most recent generations. So one, we can accumulate harmful loci, and two, we can lose variation so that we have, uh, we have less clay to work with as we're molding our animals. And so now I'll talk a little bit about new inbreeding mattering more than old inbreeding. So this is the proven genotype Holstein bolts inbreeding from, from CDC prior to the and so uh, the pedigree is the uh, the colors for hard to see. The pedigree is the solid wood line. The uh, genomic inbreeding is the broken gold line, and then there's kind of a dash line. That's genomic future inbreeding. I'm not going to talk about why they're different. They all follow basically the same trend. They all come in the same figure. So you can see that over time we can settle the well, not huge increases in inbreeding. Then we get here, and what do we do here? Well, we implement genome selection. And that let us cut the generation interval in half, which means we're going a lot faster. And now we're actually making decisions about young bulls to keep them or to cull them when they're two months old and they get their genomic evaluation back. So we're really taking a problem that was very manageable and we've really kind of uh, kicked it into overdrive. Now, why is this a problem? When we were going slowly, yes, we uncovered harmful alleles, but we had time to deal with that. Now we're going real fast. But it's not just Holstein. This is data from the Angus Association. This was published um, a couple of years ago by, well, a student at NC State, Emmanuel Lozada Soto, who now works with Dr. Blackburn at USDA. And there again, this is similar to what I showed you before. There's three different measures of inbreeding in these three different boxes, but they're all showing you the same thing. There, there's been you know, uh, an increase in the speed at which inbreeding is increasing. So it's not just a dairy problem. Uh, I went back a little bit older, found some, some work from Matt Cleveland when he was at Colorado State, uh, working with those folks. This is the US Herford data. Again, you can see uh, you can see a big increase over time in the rate of inbreeding. Uh, I'm not saying that to pick on any any individual breed. It's simply to point out that we're all kind of making the same mistake. And what's really challenging with inbreeding, right? We've studied a lot and done a lot of studies in mice and in flies, things like that. And so, say flies. I'm not that interested in flies. They only have three chromosomes. It's hard to get you know excited about that. But we do know that when you do dozens or hundreds of generations of intensive inbreeding, you eventually sort of hit a tipping point and you go very quickly from things being okay, to things not being okay. The problem with that is we don't know where that cliff is. So this is a plot of whole scene breeding values. They go and see these if you want. For, for a measure of fertility by our practice rate, plotted versus inbreeding. So higher inbreeding, the lower fertility, generally speaking. 
but uh, not too worried about that, right? Well, the problem is by the time we see it show up in the performance of the animals, it might be too late to do much about it. We may have to go to Harvey and uh, try to fix the population that way from the gene bank. And somebody once asked Ernest Hemingway, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, well, two ways. He said, gradually and then suddenly. And I sort of think that this isn't so different in terms of the concept. Okay, right now we're managing to deal with higher and higher levels of inbreeding, but uh, I I'm concerned that things could get very, uh, very challenging very quickly. But we're not alone. So it's not just a cattle thing, it's not just mammals. So, so this is rainbow trap. You look at these boxes on the top, the solid boxes that um, runs of homozygosity to measure inbreeding. They don't have really good pedigrees in fish, I guess. And because of the way fish, uh, fish rebrush are not quite the same as cattle. So almost 20% here, right? Uh, lower in some lines, but they've got a, you know, they've got issues there. This is from my PhD dissertation working with dogs, with working dogs. So on the left is in the right relationship. You can see uh, as you do selection. So as you're making decisions to improve the performance for some measure, you're increasing these measures. This is from a selection experiment in mice. So I only put it up here, here because it's 122 generations. Not that holy cow. That's a lot of generations. They were selecting for litter size here, and as inbreeding increased, as you would expect, fertility decreased. Infertility, early life fitness and vigor, those sorts of traits are the traits that are most affected by inbreeding. So different traits affected in different ways. This is from a, basically a paper where they went back and looked at you know hundreds of papers from the literature and did a meta-analysis to look at the effects of inbreeding. So this is kind of the average effect of inbreeding for all these different traits, okay? And um, I see a few folks taking photos and that's fine. These slides will also be on the CDCB website probably next week. And if you like, you can go download them there. All the references are at the end, just to make it easier for folks. But you go and take a photo if you can. The, the top here are the means, the bottom is the standard deviations. So what you see in the bottom actually is that when inbreeding increases, you have a decrease in genetic variance, as well as a decrease in the mean for these traits. I know it's hard to read this table because it's giant. I put it up there so that when folks download the slides, they can look at it. Should dairy farmers worry about inbreeding? This is US data for US Holsteins. The box on the top, you want to look at the numbers that have a blue rectangle around. The issue is that we publish the effect of inbreeding on traits in units of 1%, right? So inbreeding goes up 1%. How does that affect performance? I divided that by four because we're currently averaging about a one quarter percent increase in inbreeding per year. So I just wanted to make it easier to compare that. That's what's, on the, that's what's on the top, that's the phenotypic change. On the bottom is the genetic change per year. So this is the genetic trend. So should we be worried? Well, hey, we're way down milk. You know, we're up, you know, well over 100 pounds uh, better, almost uh, eight pounds better on the back. Protein's looking good, longevity, looking great. Nothing really happening with snack cell count. Oh. Well, the inbreeding depression for daughter pregnancy rate, which is a measure of fertility, okay, we're actually de decreasing fertility faster than we're increasing the genetic trend. That's not great. These are some other measures of fertility. They're doing okay. Livability. All right. So should dairy farmers be concerned? Well, maybe you should say, sure, they should be concerned. That's different than saying panic, okay? Should cattle ranchers be worried about inbreeding? This is also from Emmanuel's paper that I showed uh, the Angus inbreeding trends from. So this is Angus data. And uh, I'm sorry, this turned out to be hard to see. Um, you can see it better on the slides. Is, uh, this is the three measures of inbreeding in these three blocks. 
And this is looking at a few traits. It's looking at heifer pregnancy rate, birth weight, weaning weight, post weaning gain. Okay. And what it's showing us is that not much effect on heifer pregnancy rate, but there is some, some negative effects, say some inbreeding depression for the growth traits. Again, these are small. When you look at it in proportion to the means, it's not that big, but it is saying that in a population where you may feel, hey, we don't have to worry about inbreeding. Inbreeding is a dairy problem, or it's a pig problem, or it's a, you know, a chicken problem. Well, we're starting to see some evidence of, of this kind of uh, problem, it's not the right word, but situation maybe in beef cattle. So what do we do about it? And I, I think that it was hinted that uh, maybe I would mention this earlier during Dr. Hayes' talk, during one of the questions. So we'll jump on it right out of the gate. Can we do something with the breeding balance to manage and breed? And we actually do in the United States. So when we calculate a breeding value for a bull, okay, and then we subtract off the effects of future inbreeding. So if so, if it's a bull who's highly related to the population and is expected to increase the level of inbreeding, we reduce his PTA. If he's an outcross bull, his PTA might get bumped up a little bit. Okay, so we actually already do that in the U.S. Um, and we actually switch to using genomic inbreeding in place of pedigree inbreeding a year or two back. So the U.S. does both. Now, does that limit the number of bulls that all come out of the same family? At the end of the day, not really. It also doesn't really do anything about embryo donors. The, the point is that we do this adjustment, but because of the genetic trend under genomics, the adjustments are small and it doesn't cause very much re-ranking. So we don't see a case where a bull goes from being the number two bull adjust for inbreeding, and now he's the number 500 bull. Maybe he goes from being the number two bull to being the number four bull. So we do this, but I would say that in practice, it hasn't been that helpful. But hey, here's an easy idea. We could trim all the pedigrees, right? So in the U.S., we calculate inbreeding back to a base of 1960. Well, if we move that base up to 1970, a bunch of the inbreeding goes away. That's super easy. And you could say, well, why would you do that? Is that cheating? My response would be, that would be placing the emphasis on more recent inbreeding than on old inbreeding, right? So I'm more concerned about inbreeding that's happened, say, since 1990 than I am an inbreeding that happened in 1960. So if we changed our base year, the levels of inbreeding would go down, but they would be reflecting the more the more recent inbreeding. Some countries in their dairy evaluations already do this. You know, three years, four years, or uh, sorry, three, four, five generations, not years. And um, so we could do that. I haven't convinced people yet. What if we didn't publish the PTAs? Because again, in the dairy case, this is what drives a lot of this mess. Okay. We publish the bull rank. And everybody looks and says, they call their semen guy and they say, you know, I want a hundred units of, uh, of the number one bull. And everybody does that. Well, part of the problem is we're using young bulls now. So there's not enough semen to go around, but they're still all fighting over the same. And the fact is the difference between the number one bull and the number 50 bull, as an example, is going to be extremely small for in terms of profitability for most dairy farmers. So how do we get them to ignore that? What if we don't publish the PTAs? We won't show it to them. Or maybe we show them, you know, uh, green for good bulls, yellow for average bulls, and red for low quality bulls. Or maybe only the main assignment software knows the PTAs, but not the people. And so I was looking around and I was looking at the Leachman Cattle catalog, and I saw, at least not here, so he's not going to hear the, the, the promise. Well, I see they have EPDs up at the top, 
But then I see, you know, some road traits, values, other disposition traits. They have stars, not, not the individual numbers. So you guys are already ahead of the dairy guys, and we need to quit thinking that we know, all, uh, know everything and have all the good ideas because you guys are onto something. Because this is giving you a measure of the quality of the bull, but people aren't focused on and obsessing over, hey, this bull is two points higher than that bull. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Well, what if we got a little more exotic? What if we didn't worry about the bulls because we're just going to buy terminal dairy embryos, right? So we're going to buy an embryo from somebody that's going to make high quality you know, milking cows to put in the herd. And if you do it right, there might not even be any inbreeding. <laughs> well, basically there won't be any because the, the recipient of the embryo isn't related to the embryo. But, oh, hold on. Someone still has to maintain purebred lines. Um, the cost of ET, forget the cost of the embryo, the cost of actually implanting the embryo is high. You can't just have your guy who does your AIs do it. So I don't know, this may or may not be fiscally viable, but you know, depending on how creative you got with these lines and crosses, maybe you don't need to worry about making the matings on the farm at all. We could change the selection index. Uh, it was also discussed after Dr. Hayes' presentation. What if we put some measure of genetic diversity in the selection index? I did a little bit of modeling on that, uh, Jenny Price, and Australia did some modeling on that. And the real problem is the economic value of genetic diversity at this time is so low that again, it doesn't offset the value of the increase in the other traits. Plus, as a geneticist, right, if you think of yourself as an academic kind of guy, this is just a way of doing something called optimal contribution selection very lazily. And we've all been ignoring optimal contribution selection because only Europeans do that because why would we want to slow down the rate of genetic gain? And that's what you have to do. You can't get both. You can't get more diversity and more genetic gain. You've got to pick one. Oh, but hold on. I've got the answer. We'll do gene editing. Right? I, I got in trouble last time I suggested this because I said, well, we don't care right? How many recessives we uncover. As soon as we uncover it, we can use gene editing to fix it. And then we can get all the advantages of inbreeding and we don't have to worry about the disadvantages, right? And if we get something like surrogate sires and in vitro breeding technologies working, we don't give, we don't, we don't fall too far behind in terms of the rate of gain. So, hey, cool. Oh, except that we don't actually know where it's important in the genome to maintain genetic diversity and where it's not. And I, I commented to someone earlier, as far as I know, the world record for the number of simultaneous gene edits is four, at least in cattle. Exceligen has a live calf on the ground with four edits. So I mean, am I kidding with some of this stuff? Here's the thing that we have to confront. Genetic evaluation is a tool for ranking animals for making mating decisions. Genetic evaluation is not a tool for managing diversity in the population. And we can try and shoehorn that into the system, and it's just not going to work real well. Okay. So, for example, take where we do the adjustment to the PTA for dairy bulls to account for inbreeding. That's really an ad hoc kind of on the fly adjustment. There's not really a strong theoretical justification for it. It's the kind of thing that just seemed like, well, maybe it's a good idea, let's try it. And if you're really interested in this, I have a whole paper about it that you can go read in Journal of Dairy Science. So there are other things we could do. We could do outcrosses between studs, right? Because some data suggests that we're starting to see the different lines and different artificial insemination companies kind of differentiate. So maybe you could use select bulls this year. Next year, you use ABS bulls. Maybe the year after, you use alpha bulls. Mm -hmm. You could do something like that, I guess. 
Um, I know that like Cyrus had a product like that several years ago. I don't know that it really got a lot of uh, attention, but you could think of that as a sort of rotational sort of rating system. And the other issue is, well, how much difference do we actually expect that to lead to? Probably not a lot. So it's not really going to solve the problem. <laughs> what if in vitro breeding worked? Well, that's an awesome question. And I think in vitro breeding is an amazing idea. But, you know, you might as well ask, what if I won the lottery? Because the fact, okay, so the idea with in vitro breeding is you can make an embryo. That's easy to do, right? We know how to do that. You then take embryonic stem cells and you force them to develop into oocytes and spermatozoa. So you get gametes to make the next generation of animals without ever having to create a bull or a heifer calf. Very, very elegant biology. Some folks working in mice have made kind of an oocyte-like structure, not really an oocyte that way. No one's ever made a spermatozoan that way. I'll bet you $20 no one ever does. And eventually, you're still going to have to have some live animals at some point in that process. So I think it's a oh, sorry. I think it's amazing if it would work. I just think so much work has to be done that that's you know a thirty year project, twenty year project, not a five year project. One of the other issues, again, this may be more a dairy issue, but I was working for Peak Genetics. When this hit the front page of the Wall Street Journal, an article about inbreeding in Holstein cows. And I think that was on the weekend because I started getting a bunch of emails and texts that Fanny Upon wanted to know what was going on. And the point is, y'all, we don't talk about it so much, maybe as we should. We all depend on social license to operate, right? At the end of the day, Consumers have to be willing to go into a store and buy the meat and the milk and everything else that we're producing. Okay. You know, if you start seeing enough stories like this, a lot of folks are going to start thinking about things. And are they going to allow this to be to continue? Maybe the worst thing that could happen for all of us is that consumers will tell the stores, I want y'all to do something about that. I don't want milk from those inbred cows. And the retailer tells the processor, hey, our consumers aren't gonna buy milk from those cows. And all of a sudden you have a rule now from the processor who buys your product that says, well, I won't buy your milk if inbreeding is over 5% in your herd. Now you can say that's ridiculous, but be, I wanna be clear. I'm not talking about government mandates or regulations. I'm talking about market-driven reactions. So we can't just ignore inbreeding forever. Are there better solutions than these things I've laid out there? There's lots of solutions. There's a whole table on the right side of the slide of solutions. A lot of them have brilliant math behind them, super smart math, but geneticists don't breed cows. The people who work for genetics companies don't breed cows. Farmers and cattle and breeding cows. And uh, the fact is, I've already mentioned everybody's neighbors should use different bulls. In dairy, bulls aren't even assigned to particular cows anymore on large dairies. And all these things in the table on the right are solutions to this problem that nobody uses. The reason they're not used is they're, they don't line up with the realities of production agriculture. So where does that leave us? And Warren, I'm, I'm okay on time? Okay. So I'm not going to read you a giant long quote from Jay Lush, right? Jay Lush is the father of animal breeding. Um, but I will point out that Jay Lush knew in 1945 that the selection index and genetic selection in general is not really a particularly good tool for dealing with increasing levels of homozygosity. Okay, so you can't just say we're going to change directions on the selection objective and undo uh, damage we've done there. So it's not, not an original idea for me. It was known a long time ago. But I would also point out that that, that Lush also said, hey, if the geneticist is doing their job correctly with selection, 
we may end up with almost complete homozygosity in the genome because we have successfully matched up all of the best genes and through careful management, we have eliminated the undesirable alleles from the population and we're left with these ideal animals. Like, well, that, that's cool, right? Wow. So that's nice to hear JLush validate what we're trying to do until you stop and think. Well, um, does the Ancus, does the ideal Ancus animal today, is that the same as you thought was the ideal Ancus animal in 1980? Because I can tell you the ideal Holstein cow in 1960 was not the ideal Holstein cow in 1970. It's not the ideal Holstein cow today. So part of the problem is if we do this and we build them all the best uh, low in one animal, well, what happens when we want to change direction? We're out of luck because we got rid of all the variation, which is what I was trying to show with that graph earlier. So just a lot to think about here. So homozygosity, definitely bad when there's inbreeding depression, but it can also be undesirable because we, run, we, we don't have any runway when we need to change direction later. Increased genetic load, right? That's the increased buildup of harmful alleles. Um, it compromises an animal's adaptability. The animal can't adapt to new health challenges. The animal can't react to changes in environment. So I can tell you living in Wisconsin, the winter in the Midwest is a lot different today than it was when I lived in the Midwest in the late 90s. So things change, whatever the reason. And when we don't leave enough buffer genetically, we can't react to those changes. And, um, you know, I don't know. We all like to do things our own way and not have anyone tell us what to do. But that does mean it's a challenge to manage genetic diversity in a population when all of the decision making is distributed and each person is making the decision that's the best for them. That's not necessarily the decision that's best for the management of a population. So maybe actually the swine and the poultry guys can do a little bit better job than us in some respects because they have complete control over the population in a way that we'll never have with cattle. And uh, I think I'm gonna wrap up there. I'd be happy to entertain questions.